Mu'ad in his army, Rasulullah, what does he say? He's, uh, the, the people, what do they say? They say, whenever things got tough, we used to all go and hide behind Rasulullah. We used to all go and back ourselves behind Rasulullah. Even Ali ibn Abi Talib, with all his greatness and all his strength, will say, when the, get, when the going got tough, as they say, we all went and hid behind Rasulullah. Because a leader, if he holds charisma, he can be extremely powerful. If a leader speaks to his people, he can be extremely powerful. But leadership is not just a matter of a person having administrative qualities. Sometimes the leaders in our community, you find him that he's donated to the whole mosque. You find that he's donated thousands. Yet you see this person, in terms of religious knowledge, he has no religious knowledge. But in terms of administration, he's a good administrator. He's very good files, accounts. He's good at saying salam to people. He's good at welcoming people in the door. He knows how to eat with a knife and fork. But in terms of religious ability, no knowledge whatsoever. The first one to have his daughter mixed in their wedding. The first one to have music in there. But mashallah, he's a leader of a community because he's good at donating things. Unfortunately, in our own communities, we have made this idea that leaders can be only administratively gifted. Whereas we find that a leader needs to be someone with administration, but also with a religious ability. In the same way with ulama, if an alim has the whole of the Qur'an as his knowledge, and an alim has so much, for example, historical ability in Nahj al and an alim has learned all the hadith, but if the alim does not possess any akhlaq, then he is not worth anything. Because a person's basis as a leader is their akhlaq. That's why I narrate to you a very famous incident about one of the ulama. And some of you may have heard the story before, that one of the ulama, he has studied in Qum. He narrates about how he later became a great leader, was not through so much his knowledge, but through his akhlaq. That he needed a combination of what? Of leadership qualities, religious abilities, and akhlaq. He says that when I was studying in Qum, I was studying in Qum, and when, while I was studying, I had my teacher there. Whenever I wanted to go back to Tahran to see my parents, I would find that my teacher would always block me. Again, I would say to him, my parents are in Tahran. Let me go and see them. No. Summer? No. Winter? No. Anytime? No. He says I would keep on asking. I would never ever get any positive feedback. He says what then happened was, before my teacher died, he said to me that I'm going to give you one piece of advice if you're going to be a great scholar. And that piece of advice is what? It's for you to maintain a relationship relationship with your people, a relationship of akhlaq. Never get angry when you are a leader of a community. So this person says that when my teacher eventually died, I went back to my town. When I went back to my town, I noticed the people were very receptive. He said, except a few people who weren't that receptive. He said, I began to wonder why weren't they receptive. I didn't get any answer. He says, one night, in the middle of the night, someone comes and knocks at the door of my house. And he knocks at the door at what time? Three o'clock in the morning, let's say. He knocks at the door. He says, we're in the middle of a small village. I'm wondering who would knock at the door at that time of night. Surely it must be something important. It must be an emergency. He says, I came down and I met someone at the door. That person, he looked at me and he said, Maulana, I have a question to ask you. He said, I'm thinking to myself, who would come and ask me a question at three in the morning? Yani, I may have a khlaq, but at three in the morning, ask me a question. He says, so what I did, I said, yes, go ahead. What's your question? He said, Mawlana, how does uh, feces taste? <coughs> Please understand the point. How does feces taste? Now you're looking at him, you're, imagine what Mawlana must be thinking. Because if someone asked me that question, I could be the biggest leader of a community. But at three o'clock in the morning, I'd be thinking twice about my reply. He says, I replied to him and I recognized here what my teacher meant in leadership skills. He said, I said to him, feces at the beginning tastes sour. Then it tastes sweet, then it tastes bitter. He said, the man's looking at me thinking, what do you mean sour, sweet, bitter? How do you know this? He said, I know through looking at the way flies act around feces. So what do you mean? He says, whenever flies swarm around feces, you find at the beginning that they swarm around it. So I gather that it must be sour. And then you see straight away that they all go within it. So I gather it must be sweet. And then you see that they all die whilst they are in it. So I gather it must be bitter. 
He says, that man looked at me and said, Mawlana, the only reason I have come at 3 o'clock in the morning to ask you this question is because I wanted to test you as the leader of our community. That everything you act from the pulpit and everything you say from the pulpit, is it confirmed in your actions or is it just mere historical facts? He said, now I have come to test you as the leader and I have understood why the ulama, when their akhlaq is great, they come as the perfect combination. So here you understand that a leader needs to combine a certain amount of qualities in order to be seen as being an inspiration to those around him. That's why recently you will find that many biographies have come out about leaders. Amongst these biographies which has come out, or amongst these historical books which has come out, was a book which really shocked me. But a book which tried to show you that the war continues, and that the war against Al Muhammad will never stop. The book was called Muawiyah, the Restorer of the Muslim Faith. Muawiyah, the restorer of the Muslim faith. This book is written by someone called Aisha Bewley. In London, the book is written, it is being published everywhere, it is available on the internet. Muawiyah, the restorer of the Muslim faith. In this book, she seeks to highlight how Muawiyah bin Abu Sufyan is one of the greatest leaders to ever emerge in Islamic history. She says he was a man of great political ability, a man of great administrative ability. She says, never will there come anyone like Muawiyah who came and saved the religion of Islam when it was facing destruction. And in this book, she goes on to explain Muawiyah Muawiyah in different ways, highlighting that Muawiyah was one of the greatest khulafa and we should learn from Muawiyah and learn from his akhlaq. Now, how do us as Shia reply to this? Because it is a very important point to understand that Muawiyah bin Abu Sufyan is arguably one of the true people in Islamic history who changed the whole course of Islamic history. We all know who number one was, but number two was him. He had one of the biggest effects on the change in Islamic history. But as Shia, I know we do not like Muawiyah, but how many of us are actually able to reply to those who say Muawiyah was bad? How do you reply? How exactly do you come forward with an idea that Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan was not a bad leader? How do you come forward to the idea that Muawiyah was a bad leader? How do you come forward with the idea that this was a person who attacked the message of Rasulullah? It's not enough for the Shia to simply sit down every year and come and say, we hate Muawiyah, we hate Yazid. We don't like Muawiyah, we don't like Yazid. We, dis- we, dis- we, dis- we dislike all of these people. No. The Shi'i must be able to write replies to any book like this which is published. Because once you understand Muawiyah, you will understand why the course of Islamic history changed. And why Aba Abdullah was killed in Karbala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. First and foremost, when you discuss Muawiyah, how do you reply to those who say Muawiyah is the restorer of the Muslim faith? First and foremost, we, when we look at leadership theories in Islam, there are four main theorists who discuss Islamic leadership. Number one, al mawardi Number two, al juwaini Number three, Ibn Taymiyyah. Number four, Ibn al muqaffa These are the four main theorists in Islamic leadership. Anyone who wants to know within the scholars of Islam, irrespective of Sunni or Shia, you want to know who are the main people who wrote about Islamic leadership, you go to these four. These are the main four. Each one of them has his own opinion about what an Islamic leader is. As an example, Al-Mawardi, he wrote the book Al-Ahkam Sultaniyah. Al-Mawardi, he lived in the time of what? Of the Abbasids. The Abbasids who ruled after Bani Umayyah. In this book, Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyah, he says any leader in the religion of Islam, and he wrote this book as, an, as a defense of one of the Abbasid Khulafa, who could not save Islam if he done everything he could. He tried to write this book as a defense. He said, any Khalifa who comes into Islamic power needs to follow the four rightly guided Khulafa, in his opinion. He says that any Khalifa needs to combine the ability to have Quranic knowledge, number one, Number two, he needs to have political ability as well. You can't just have full knowledge, nor can you just have what? Administrative ability. You need a combination of the two. This is number one. Number two, al Jawaini he had a similar school. al Jawaini used to say that a leader must be able to look after the social affairs of the people. He must be in touch with the social affairs of the people. But he must also be in touch with the political affairs of the people. Number two. Number three, Ibn Taymiyyah, he put forward the Hanbali school. And in his opinion, a leader was a representative of God on earth. 
And that any leader who's a representative of God must be the one who looks after the Qur'an and looks after any teaching that has come from our Prophet Muhammad and is one who in the social affairs is able to show what the Qur'an is teaching in these social affairs. Number three. Number four, Ibn al-Muqaffa, he wrote the book Al-Adab al-Kabir wa Al-Adab al-Saghir. And in this book, he wrote about the idea of the importance of any leader in Islam having a great amount of knowledge of the religion of Islam. But you can't have a leader who people come and ask him questions. He says, go and ask someone else, go and ask someone else. A leader must be someone who is able to reply to any question which the Muslims come and pose on him. Once you've understood these theories, you then come to examine Bani Umayyah and Muawiyah. You then come and examine him in the light of these theories. Because when I reply, if I am going to reply with Shia leadership theories, they'll say, you Shia believe that the leaders are chosen by God. We're not interested. Okay, I won't reply with Shia leadership theories. I bought you al Mawarti, I bought you al Juwaini, I bought you Ibn Taymiyyah, and I bought you Ibn al Muqaffa. These are four Sunni leadership theorists. I am showing that each one of them is saying, a leader must combine political ability and spiritual gifts. Now you come to analyze Muawiyah's family. You see, with Muawiyah's family, the first person you need to analyze...